Hello, everyone. It's an honor to be here to share the story of Hong Kong and the friends in Hong Kong. Um, very happy to be speaking with you, and um, I hope you guys um, had learned more about China and the CCP with our panel speakers today. I want to start with a statement that a lot of you may find confusing or even controversial, which is Hong Kong has never been free. First, it was part of the Chinese empire. Then it belonged to the United Kingdom for 150 years. And even in 1997, when the United Kingdom handed over Hong Kong to China, the people of Hong Kong were not consulted or included in the negotiations. Hong Kong has never been free. I was born in 1999, just two years after the handover, when Hong Kong became part of China as a special administrative region. China promised one country, two systems, so that Hong Kong will not change for 50 years and Hong Kong people are to run Hong Kong. To this day, Beijing and Hong Kong authorities had tried to paint a picture to make the world believe that Hong Kong is a free society, that it is an international financial center protected with rule of law. But the people of Hong Kong have woken up to these lies, and we are fighting for our democracy. My story starts when I was 10 year old. I saw um, a documentary on TV about the Tiananmen Square massacre. I saw soldiers shooting at unarmed citizens and driving tanks into the crowd. I saw students covered in blood on makeshift stretchers, rows of bodies covered in sheets, <clears throat> excuse me, and a man curled up on a sidewalk in the fatal position with his skull cracked open. It is shocking no matter how old you are, but especially as a 10-year-old. So I went to the annual vigil on June 4th, and Hong Kong was the last place in China that could honor the victim. It was my first experience seeing people freely gather to express themselves, and it left a profound impression on me about freedom of speech and freedom of assembly, both values that define Hong Kong yet ceased to exist in mainland China. And in the summer of 2014, when I was 15 year old, the CCP announced a new election scheme to narrow the people's already limited rights to elect our chief executive. Student leaders like Joshua Wong called on students to walk out of classrooms and take to the streets and let their voice be heard. I joined the walkout with thousands of students. We rallied in front of the government's building headquarters and eventually occupied Hong Kong's busiest highway. That day, police launched 87 tear gas canisters towards students and peaceful demonstrators. They chased us, beat us, pushed us back again and again, but we didn't give up. We wore helmets and goggles, held umbrellas to shield ourselves from pepper spray. All we could think about was standing our ground against police aggression. I was beaten with a police baton, and I was pepper sprayed in the face. As I was standing in the midst of tear gas smoke, I looked at the people fighting alongside me for the same democratic values. I saw there was a community, community built up where strangers looked out for each other and became neighbors in tents. We were all there to defend our home and our freedom because we are Hong Kongers. I am a Hong Konger. And although we never achieved universal suffrage, this movement completely changed my life and the landscape of Hong Kong civic society. In 2019, the Hong Kong government proposed an extradition law that would violate our judicial independence to allow anyone, anyone in Hong Kong to be extradited to China and be put on trial under Chinese law. Millions of Hong Kongers took to the streets and came up with five demands the extradition law to be repealed, 
justice for peaceful protesters who were detained, attacked, or died from police aggression, and the right to elect our own official as promised in the basic law. Once again, the government ignored people's voice and increased state violence against protesters. Police started shooting straight into the crowd with bullets. They took siege of a university campus, blocking thousands of young protesters from food and medical assistance unless they surrendered. Throughout the movement, 11 people had died from committed suicide. Dozens of others disappeared, and over 10,000 people were arrested. Our city was deeply wounded. We were left together, glued together by pain, anger, and tragedy. And as a final insult to the people of Hong Kong, China imposed a national security law in 2020 to criminalize any individual under succession, subversion, terrorism, or collusion with foreign forces, facing up to life sentencing in Hong Kong or mainland China. Immediately, I was warned that I was on the government's shortlist of people who will be arrested. I was only 21 year old, and I had to make this life-altering decision in 48 hours. I was torn just from thinking, should I stay in Hong Kong or leave? Would I really get life in prison, in solitary confinement? Or would it be better for me to leave Hong Kong and be voice of my friends in prison? Late at night, I decided to get on a plane, and I still remember as the plane took off, I was looking out to the lights of Hong Kong through the window, thinking this might be the last time I will see this beautiful city, my home. And within weeks, they had imprisoned 47 of the most inspiring leaders from the movement. And now they're facing the possibility of life behind bars. Media outlets were forced to shut down and journalists like Jimmy Lai was put in jail. So many Hong Kongers were forced to flee the city they call home. In 2021, I secured asylum in the United States. Meanwhile, there are thousands of political prisoners in Hong Kong with, a, with the youngest only 13 year old. The words political prisoners and political asylee are the two labels I never imagined would apply to Hong Kong people. But I'm afraid this is the reality of Hong Kong today, a reality that the Chinese government and Hong Kong government both try to cover up. And even when I am in the US where I am supposed to be safe, me and my friends have been bullied, intimidated, threatened by the CCP. The same has happened to Hong Kongers, Uyghurs, Tibetans, Taiwanese, and Chinese in dissidents all over the world. We cannot accept the status quo. We must hold China accountable and let Hong Kong be Hong Kong. CCP's authoritarianism is one of the biggest threats to world order and democracy, working next to other bad actors like Russia, Iran, and Burma, just to name a few. I don't want to ask the question about why China is still on the UN's Human Rights Council, because many of us have asked that question in the past too many times now, and it is still what it is. But the least that the international community can do is to advocate for the release of political prisoners in Hong Kong and alleviates their suffering. It only takes all of you sitting here today, world leaders, journalists, activists, and people of conscience to say their names. Say Jimmy Lai's name. Say Joshua Wong, Gwyneth Ho, Owen Chow's names. Raise their public profile, make them famous, and put pressure on the CCP to release them. In the movement, we used to wave a flag that reads, restore the lights of Hong Kong. This is the revolution of our times. Today, this flag and the slogan are banned in Hong Kong. In 2016, the activist behind this slogan, Edward Leung, said, 
It is always darkest before the dawn, but just know that the dawn is about to come. Today, years have gone by and the dawn is yet to come for Hong Kong and for many of you here that are experiencing autocratic oppression. But I believe on the darkest day, we can all light a candle for one another to make the night brighter and warmer. Together, we can restore the lights of Hong Kong and the lights for this global pro-democracy movement so that one day, all the political prisoners will be free and we will be able to set foot again in our dear home and we can declare united glory to democracy and glory to Hong Kong. Thank you.